uh, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, I was here last year as well, so it's great to be back and great to see all of you um, tune into this session and uh, participate in the executive forum this year. This is fantastic, so thanks uh, for coming. Um, as you heard, uh, I get the privilege of moderating a fantastic uh, panel here with two real experts um, uh, who have for many years uh, worked in government, um, including uh, Florence Kosule, uh, who's with the U.S. Digital Service, uh, and then Ross uh, Noderft, who used to be in government but has since joined us over on the private sector side as the executive director of the um, uh, ADI, the Alliance for Digital Innovation. And so I was going to ask them as we kick off this session, and, and by the way, I am Shannon Kellogg, the Vice President for Public Policy at AWS, and I've been here about 10 years, and so I've really seen the, the growth of this summit over the years. Um, but I was going to go to our two panelists just uh, initially to ask them to tell us a little bit more about their backgrounds and their connection to this topic today. So, Ross, we'll start with you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Shannon, for having us on. Uh, like Shannon said, my name is Ross Noderf. I started in government uh, over a decade ago. Uh, was working in uh, Congress. I worked in both the House and the Senate sides, focused on everything from national security technology, homeland security technology, and then IT, uh, IT enterprise technology services. So I did the whole gamut when I was over in Congress, moved over uh, to the executive branch worked at OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, for just about three years, where I was uh, leading efforts around cybersecurity, cloud modernization. Uh, then I left, and I've been in private sector for almost five years now, doing a mix of uh, technology modernization, digital identity work, and uh, leading now, leading the Alliance for Digital Innovation, which I'm very happy about, which is a 30-member alliance. AWS is a, is a founding member of ADI, and we are working very hard right now to uh, help break down the barriers that enable departments and agencies at the federal level as well as public sector entities at the state level to really leverage modern technology today. And we're doing everything from acquisition policy to cybersecurity policy to workforce policy and, and generally advocating for more modernization. Thank you, Ross. Florence? Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Florence Casule, and I am Director of Procurement with the U.S. Digital Service. My background, so I started um, in the government about 13 or 14 years ago um, as a contract specialist um, within uh, a, a, a developmental program that was founded by the Department of Interior that wanted to fast track people with um, MBAs into the procurement space within government. And um, that path led me to DOD, um, where I stayed with DOD procurement within the fourth estate for about eight or nine years, and then jumped it all focusing on the procurement of technology and technology um, solutions. Um, and then I moved over to the civilian agencies, where I've helped lead different teams of procurement, um, contracting officers, contract specialists, on how do you buy um, modern technology. There are every agency's at different st stages of, in the evolutionary chart of what modernization means, right? And so making sure that our teams of procurement specialists uh, know how to buy those things. Um, and with U.S. Digital Service, we really just focus on getting into the different agencies where if there are any issues at hand in terms of digitization, modernization, um, that we help the procurement teams figure things out. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you both at this yeah. panel. Um, so I'm going to start with Florence in my first question. So U.S. Digital Service, it's now been in existence for several years. Um, tell us a little bit more about what you're most excited about right now, the issues you're working on, and, and just also looking at the history of USDS, what sort of sticks out to you as some of the real shining moments? Sure, great. So. We are in 2022. We've been in existence for about seven years. Um, what's exciting about, about U.S. Digital Service in the, the, right now is um, when we go into engagements with different agencies, 
saying like the words agile is not new. <laughs> you know, like making sure that, um, that the contract specialists and contracting officers and teams on the ground know what modern technologies are, that's no longer a new thing. Um, where, you know, six years ago, when we were talking about agile software development um, principles or any sort of design principles, that was brand new. Now we have partners on the ground who know what these principles are to a large extent. Um, and so when we do engagements, we're working with a much more informed base of contracting officers and contract specialists. Um, and the engagements are, I find, much richer um, because we have the ability to go in to be much more in a partnership with agencies where in the past we were really um, acting from the, from the position of thought leaders and really pushing, sometimes pushing agencies to, into um, a particular solution. Now it's much more of a partnership. Excellent. Um, thank you for that, Florence. Ross, over to you. How are you seeing government work with industry right now, you know, especially as we come out of COVID? And is there any less friction in the procurement process for your members and, and industry uh, providers? No, it's a it's a great question. So, let me let me let me set the stage for you. Right, post COVID, we have especially in the IT uh, space have seen an evolution in how agencies are leveraging technology because they've had to. Right, it's been a driver since COVID hit, where we have now, we've virtualized a, a lot more stuff than we were necessarily ready to do at any given point in time. So what, what, is that, what does that cause? That's caused people to leverage different options for, and flexibilities within the FAR. It's allowed people to leverage different opportunities with commercial solutions, offerings, CSOs at GSA, uh, OTAs in a, lot of, in a lot of senses. We've used every lever that we, traditionally may have been, I say, when I say we, I'm talking about agencies, were traditionally um, maybe a little more risk adverse at using. It's forced us to adopt technology rapidly, and what that's done is that's created some muscle movement uh, across the departments and agencies. I mean, what you're talking about with the idea of agile not being a, a, a word that's, that is foreign to people when you walk into a room at an agency is, is, is different. Now, that's the good side of it. The bad side of it is that we still have a lot of work to do, right? So it, it is, we have wonderful contracting officers, but we have an overtaxed and overburdened contracting community. And I think we have to recognize that when we talk about where we're at in a post-COVID world. That, that movement and shift has created a ton of fatigue, and we are seeing some of those contracting officers get burned out. So while yes, it has become easier, and yes, there are pathways now where our members are more, uh, it's easier for them to engage with federal customers. There is there's still you know, a lot of room left uh, to go to make it as seamless as possible. I just want a quick follow up on that. Thank you, Ross, because this is a really good point about um, you know, uh, sort of burning out contract officers. But an important component here is also training, you know, making sure that we're continuing to get talent in, contracting officer talent in the government. Y'all at USDS are pretty good at this. You know, you've, you've got a really um, good reputation on the contracting side. How are you thinking about this as you go forward and what are some of the practices that you're trying to get out there in this space of training and retaining uh, contracting talent? Sure, good question. Um, it's something that's very timely, actually. So we, um, we organize a training called DITAP, Digital IT Acquisition Program, um, training for contracting officers. It's usually um, contracting officers who are, who are on the senior side um, and who are leading modernization efforts. Um, in order for them to be well-versed in the world of software development. And so we want them to have all of the information that they need or as much information as possible in order to be informed buyers and informed uh, business advisors to their program offices. And not only the program offices, but also their legal count, the council, um, OGCs out there, budget folks, because mm -hmm. the procurement of software has, has historically been one that has been um, a bit challenging within the government because you have the conversation of 
you know, are these development do dollars, are these operations dollars, O&M versus development, sustainment. Um, and so we talk through all of that. All of that content is within that training program. Um, we've had about 600 contracting officers go through that. And um, we, we run also a very robust alumni network where we have um, monthly check-ins um, or every other month, depending on the time of year, fourth quarter, of course, we try not to have as much mm -hmm. um, because they're focused on um, right. putting out procurements and, and awarding contracts during that period of time. But the training program is really there to not only help inform the acquisition workforce, but to give and build a community so that people can like, I always tell people, phone a friend. If you don't know something or if you're trying to figure something out, phone a friend. And now the friends are more informed um, acquisition professionals as well. Um, but the training has helped significantly in, in order for people to not only advance in their careers, but to be more informed buyers and partners with their industry partners. Awesome. Um, just a quick follow-up. So you talked about the, the kind of training component. Are there other areas that you're trying to build procurement capacity to scale to continue to get those great technology outcomes across government? Sure. So the type of engagements that, we, that USDS does, we go into agencies when there are certain challenges um, at hand to help either build a digital solution or help build out a digital solution or make some corrections somewhere. When we go into those engagements, we are a multidisciplinary team. So we have our engineers, our product folks, designers, and procurement. And so as the procurement um, person on a team, we engage with the acquisition professionals within that agency. Mm -hmm. And so I am an advocate for like make friends with your with your acquisition community and partners as quickly as possible because they are the ones who are going to help you scale whatever is being built at that time. Um, and so Sucks. it's through that those engagements that it's not only my team is only 12 people within USDS. That's amazing. We are in yeah. a bunch of different agencies and we cannot do all of this work on our own, right? So it's really about like teaching a person to fish or fish um, in a new way. And so um, in terms of scaling that, that acquisition talent across government, we really see it as our role to not only engage with the larger um, program office and budget and um, legal team out there, but with the acquisition team on the ground in order to make sure that they understand how we work and how we help build something and scale it out. That's, that's terrific. Ross, this has to be music to your ears when you hear this type of approach, right, in government? I mean, absolutely. So uh, there's, I wrote a couple of things. One, the integrated approach I think is important to footstomp, right? Having a team, not just of, of acquisition officers, but a, a completely integrated team that has, a, has technology professionals, engineers, solutions architects, the whole gamut coming in to help troubleshoot is a wonderful, wonderful service that can be offered to the agencies. That said, I mean, you have 12 people on your team. That's not nearly enough. And that's kind of, I, I think it's one of the things that ADI cares deeply about is how do we, how do we take the good work that you're doing and magnify it and amplify it and, and invest resources from the government into the work you're doing. Because you have to teach folks how to fish, but you also have to build that integrated team at the department and agency level. And I think that's one of the things that we often see, and we talk about these, the contracting officers and, and, and some of the workforce issues we have. We're asking contracting officers on a daily basis to understand all of the solutions that are here in this room right now and how those need to be purchased. What's the best way to purchase them? How to go about doing it? We also need to make sure that our partners at the federal agencies understand the contracting process as well so that we have that integrated approach to help bring on new and innovative companies. And that's something that ADI cares deeply about and what we constantly advocate for. One more thing, I think it's interesting to note, um, both Senators Peters and Portman had an acquisition hearing last week and they brought this particular piece up. They said, what are we doing? What do we need to do? And Soraya Correa, who, who was with DHS for years uh, and, and led a lot of innovation at the Department of Homeland Security, said just that. She said, look, our contracting officers, we need to recruit more. We need to make it, make it a profession that people want to come to. We need to do all of those things. But we also need to make sure that we are sharing the burden of acquisition. And I say burden of acquisition, the responsibility of acquisition with our entire teams and our entire departments and agencies. 
I am seeing some heads nodding on that, on that last point that you made. Um, sticking with you, Ross, so you talked about the hearing last week. What are some of the other government policy trends that you're seeing, whether it's from Capitol Hill or in the administration right now, um, that uh, you know, are um, impacting industry, impacting government agencies? C kind of what are you seeing from the industry side at a policy level in this space? Sure. So I think the big muscle movements at the federal level right now are around cybersecurity and around customer experience. Those are the two that are coming out of the administration. And what we're seeing in Congress is a reflection of those efforts. So I'll give you an instant, for instance, tomorrow they're gonna to hold a hearing uh, on the House side on the Technology Modernization Fund. Well, the Technology Modernization Fund is that bucket of money that was funded through the American Rescue Plan that is going to help agencies invest in both their cybersecurity modernization efforts, their customer experience modernization efforts, which, by the way, and we were talking about this beforehand, should not be mutually exclusive investments, right? I mean, we can walk and chew gum right. at the same time. Modernization and security go hand in glove. As you modernize, that access to new technology is naturally more secure because it's more built in. So uh, we are seeing more trends focused on CX. We're seeing cybersecurity, especially zero trust. I know that you've all heard the buzzword. Uh, so is Congress, and they are doing a lot right now to push for modernization around their security. They're also looking at um, compliance issues. So we have seen the FedRAMP bill has been talked about on the, on the both House and Senate side quite a bit. We're still waiting to see it get over the line. There is FISMA modernization, and I will, I'll tell you, it's Federal, uh, Federal Information Security Modernization Act uh, updates, which will bring some of the new policy professionals that are in government, whether it's the National Cyber Director or uh, the CISA director into the mix to really help drive cybersecurity. We're also seeing and hearing discussions, and I'd be curious your reaction as well, to uh, potential updates to FATARA, which is the scorecard that has really helped advance and drive CIO authority and autonomy within departments and agencies. So that's just a flavor of some of the stuff that's, that we're seeing. Yeah, that's now. a good overview. I, I have to chuckle a little bit. Um, uh, because Ross, uh, you know, he represents this uh, really fantastic industry association. 20 years ago today, I was his, basically in his chair representing another industry group working on FISMA. <laughs> it was 20 years ago. It's about time that uh, we're seeing some updates there. Um, so, uh, Florence, let me turn it to you. Uh, I have a couple more questions I, I wanted to um, uh, come to you with, but just sticking on this topic a little bit about security, Lots of activity, not just in Congress, but um, some executive orders that have come out, you know, over the last 18 months uh, from the president. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, some of those security directives are impacting the work that you do and, and what you're seeing uh, within USDS and, and at the agency level as a result of some of these EOs? Oh, certainly. I mean, the cybersecurity EO definitely was, um, when that was issued, um, it got a lot of our attention. I mean, a number of people within, um, of course, out of OMB and USDS, we, we saw it before it hit the wires, right? So we knew what was coming. Um, when, it, in terms of our engagements, we have engineers and teams on the ground and agencies helping ship code and um, deliver on certain digital solutions. And so when, and when we partner with our industry um, leaders and partners, small businesses, large businesses, we are making sure that any language that's within any sort of contractual relationship or contract document is, folds in um, the language of those EOs or the spirit of the EOs. Um, uh, another EO that I want to bring up is the customer experience um, executive order as well that, that Ross mentioned. Um, a lot of when these executive orders are issued, or even an MMO that's talking about equity and procurement, um, when these are issued, they ha at some point it has to trickle to the acquisition workforce, mm -hmm. right? In order for people to understand the what, like wh how does this now affect 
my life on the ground to see and realize these into documentation and into contractual engagements. And so we're, the work that we do on my team is we'll look through those, the different executive orders and try to do the research ahead of time for our acquisition partners on the ground along with our um, monthly syncs that we have with the Office of Federal Procurement Policy um, in order to make sure that we are communicating out to our to the alumni of DITAP and to the workforce acquisition workforce writ large, mm -hmm. what does this mean for you? Mm -hmm. So this executive order came out. You should what you shouldn't do is like take something and like lift and shift it and drop it into a contract because that's not going to be well understood by many people. Um, what is actually the intent of the EO? Um, is to make all of our our systems more secure. Mm -hmm. But also the customer experience EO is all around making um, digital solutions that are delightful to the people who, are, who need them the most, right? Um, we don't want to sink money into solutions that at the end of the day are not secure and don't meet the needs of the people that they're intended to meet, right? Um, and along with the equity and procurement good, yeah. um, memo, we want to make sure that more um, businesses can come to the table and play. Right? Um, and more small businesses, more, more small disadvantaged business, women-owned small businesses, et cetera, are here, are there to play and are given the opportunities to play as much as possible. On that last point, um, as you continue to move forward at USDS, are there other things that you're doing around diversity, equity, inclusion in the procurement process? Are there specific things? You've got you know, a number of agency folks in the room. You've got industry partners. Are there specific things that you're looking for as you uh, move out with some of those initiatives? Great question. So we, um, we for the first time in, with USDS, and I think it's, it's the same in a lot of agencies, we have a DEIA um, director who is helping us think through our different um, policies and behaviors within our own um, organization. One thing that we're that I'm working with her on is how do we look at um, market research efforts around like how are we reaching um, the our industry partners through RFIs? You know, are our 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 industry partners only looking at you know Fed Biz Ops or now Sam.gov? Is that the only place that, that the government should be placing information? I know that there are agencies that are out there dropping RFIs or market research efforts on LinkedIn, places like you know platforms like LinkedIn, placing them in um, within GitHub. Um, in places where, like, meet the industry partners where they are in order to bring in um, information in a more efficient way and in a, in a more equitable way. Asking for, you know, a 50-page document mm. as a result of an RFI, is that really going to give you the best result? Or are we eliminating some people from playing by asking for such a large, um, you know, large effort? I don't think so. So, sure. you know, making sure that we are, we are engaging th with industry in a smart way and, and hearing from industry as much yep. as possible in order to, in order to, to make the, the effort um, commensurate with what we're trying to do. Fantastic. A um, little bit of a call to action there, too, uh, for the industry partners out in the audience. So, Ross, I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, ask you a specific follow-up question about the Great. customer experience EO. Um, so, wearing your industry hat and the fact that you do have some agencies out here, what progress are you seeing in the agency's implementation of that EO? And as the, you know, industry voice on the panel, what are some of the things that you'd like to see that aren't happening? No. And um, so I think it's, it's important to note, this executive order came out several months or a couple months ago. We'll, we'll say relatively recently, but we've seen, we haven't seen a a lot of movement externally forward. And th that's one of the things that we are, are tracking at ADI very closely right now. Um, what we have seen is that there are five life experiences that are gonna drive and underpin all of the requirements that are uh, going to be baked into some of the contracts uh, as, as part of the customer experience efforts. And those life experiences are cross-agency life experiences. Now, many of you in the audience have been working with public sector partners for many years now. So you understand that when I say the requirements that are gonna be developed are cross-agency requirements, I'm sure there's a, a healthy bit of skepticism out there on how this is gonna get accomplished. And I think that's part of the reason why we have not seen um, 
an accelerated movement forward yet because they are doing this very deliberately and taking their time. There's also, and, and I appreciate uh, the chief information officer and the, and the administrative GSA, because both of them have, have noted, hey, we've tried this seven times before. We've tried to update this policy quite a few times before and have not had the traction we want. So we're gonna be very deliberate and very intentional about our process here to make sure that we actually deliver on the intent of what we've written in this executive order. So what, what, what are we waiting to see at ADI? There is a period of time right now that, that departments and agencies are in and they're working with their constituencies. So whether it's USDA working with farmers, VA working with veterans, folks are engaging with their actual customers on the ground to understand what the front end needs of that customer experience look like. Those are being baked in together into a report uh, which will detail what the customer experience roadmap should look like. From there, that will flow into a series of requirements that are gonna be both interagency and cross-agency in nature, and those, I think, will eventually uh, work, be worked into contracts, and you'll start to see more out there on what the needs are. So that's one piece. The other piece that we have to pay attention to is the back-end functionality. So what is, what is the customer experience really based in? And that's that's good, strong data management, identity management across these multiple platforms. So if you think about what these life experiences are, you want to be able to go in, whether it's through the federal front door that they're saying, that they're working on right now, that the government's working on, uh, and be able to access what you need to access when you need to access it. And that requires your data to have portability, identifications associated with it, and to really match seamlessly with you when you engage at any point in time in your customer lifecycle. That's a big lift. That's a big lift in any enterprise organization, and it's a very big lift in the federal government. So we are tracking closely what the investments look like there, what the plans look like there, and how they're feeding directly into requirements so that companies like AWS or companies like, like yours in the audience can really plug in and help provide the commercial solutions that can underpin uh, some of these challenges that exist in, in, in the agencies today. Can I follow up that? Please? Absolutely, Florence. <laughs> so um, I would love to challenge anyone here. If you see, even before the customer experience um, initiatives are pushed into um, contracts that you, that you will either bid on or you'll be subcontractors on or, or, or engage with in any way, before it, these things start trickling into, into contract language, if you see uh, any sort of contract language from the government that does not have customer experience language in it, I would push back. I would ask, who, are the, who is the customer? Who are we actually here to serve? How will, and the pushback can be in the form of your responses to the RFIs, your questions at the question and answer phase of, um, an RFQ or RFP, there are, there are moments where those, um, those engagements and conversations can happen because I certainly have been at the receiving end and I've been a contracting officer who has issued an, an RFI or an RFP or RFQ a solicitation out there years ago that had no customer at all in the ideation stage. <laughs> like we just, it was, we are here to build a system. Um, so here are all, here's the like lengthy requirements mm -hmm. list. And never was the, was the end user customer like a glimmer in my eye, certainly. Um, it was, we're here to build a system. And so long as that system is robust and secure, we're good. And then that system would be built with our industry partner and the, and the folks at the end were like, what is this? It's, uh, it's not usable, we can't, it, it doesn't function well, it's clunky, like there were all of these questions with it, only for us to then go back after the fact to make corrections. Um, I think we're all here as um, part of, we, I believe we all have a fiduciary duty to do the best by the taxpayer dollar, and as part of that responsibility, that we engage with one another to build the best solutions for the people who need them. Yeah, that's fantastic. And um, you know that shift that you and others are trying to push toward more customer obsession and more customer focus is just outstanding. Well done, well done. Um, as an Amazon guy, you know one of our leadership principles is customer obsession, so I'm a little giddy right now. 
Uh, um, for, uh, for both of you, we have time for one more question. So let me just ask, uh, starting uh, with Ross and then uh, uh, ending with Florence, what is the one thing, the one initiative that you're seeing right now in the government uh, contracting community that you really want to try to continue to help institutionalize in your respective roles? Because Florence, within government, um, uh, you're playing a, a big role there at USDS and Ross outside now. In, in this important industry role at ADI, you're also playing an important role there. So starting with you, Ross, what, um, what is that one thing, that top thing? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask for two, or one and a half. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, it, they, they go together, right? So we need to, from a risk perspective, own the risk at a senior enough level that gives the contracting community the space to use the flexibilities that the FAR affords. You can today be flexible with the FAR. Am I right? Am I right? Absolutely. We need to have a leadership moment where we recognize that this is a big deal and we are, we are now in a state where we are buying technology in a way that's never happened before and we need to recognize that. And therefore, the, the leadership needs to create the space in the room for contracting officers to leverage the FAR as creative as they did at the height of COVID. And that's one of the things that I definitely want to push. The other one I want to push, this is the, they, they go together, is the partnership with which we went to, we, we were able, the, the government was able to access the technology during the, the COVID pandemic. It was, it wasn't just the leadership and the contracting officer. It was the technologist. It was the mission owner. Everybody together in the room moving forward saying, yes, we like that. That's a great way to do it. This is the requirement they need. They were, they were doing it in an agile fashion. So it's the combination of creating the space to be flexible and making sure that you're going to buy the technology and consume that technology as a team. Thank you, Ross. Florence, over to you to close this out. Sure. OK. So I. The pandemic accelerated and really pushed um, teams to work together in a way that they had never worked together before, um, in industry and within government. Yep. And what I would love to institutionalize is this, this team aspect where um, the acquisition team is not hearing about the acquisition at the end. Mm -hmm. Right, that we are not just point. the ones who are catching the catching the football and running it. That's not. I don't see that as our as our singular role. You want to be there when the play is called. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, when the coach and whoever else is like coming up with the play and figuring things out. I am not a football person. Let's just get be clear. <laughs> so, I am. but okay. <laughs> but when they're drawing all the things, everyone is there to see it and in the huddle together to understand the what, understand the how, understand the why, understand all of the intricacies of why are we doing this, because I think that helps de-risk mm -hmm. um, the entire process. I think that informs everybody about the process, and it, and it makes sure that everyone is as, as, as engaged as possible and isn't asked, like throwing up blockers at the very last minute. Um, but it, I think it, it helps building the community and helps move things out as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. That's great. Um, I hope we're able to do that. We That's will. That's really a fantastic <laughs> idea. Well, I want to thank all of you in the audience. Uh, you, you, no one left, and that's a good sign of the panel. You guys were awesome, and I just want to thank both of you uh, as well, uh, Ross and Florence, uh, for your government service over the years, and now, Ross, your industry service. Florence, we hope you stay in government as long as uh, we can possibly keep you there. You're doing great things, and I just wanted to thank them again and all of you uh, for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.